The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody. Hope you're having a great week. In spite of being locked down, in spite of being limited in your freedoms, your ability to pursue your values all in the name of, I don't know, your local governor's decree, and uh, they claim that this is necessary, absolutely necessary. Oh, I haven't gone live. Ah, sorry, sorry, Facebook people. Here we go. Uh, right, so we f- live on Facebook. There we go. I think we're live on Facebook now. Okay. So welcome, everybody. Uh, Today, as promised, um, I'm going to get to the Super Chat questions we got yesterday. I've got a couple of other questions that I got via email, so I'm going to cover those. Then I'll take any Super Chat questions that um, that we have uh, today that any of you want to line up for today. Uh, I first want to talk about Sweden. Uh, I've got a lot of questions about Sweden. People have asked a lot of questions about Sweden uh, so we'll cover Sweden a little bit, and then we'll take we'll basically take questions. So um, that'll be the sequence of events. All right. So Sweden. Everybody uses Sweden as an example, a counter example to the rest of Europe and the rest of and, and the United States in terms of how they responded, um, how they've been responded uh, to this coronavirus. In Sweden, this story goes. Basically, there are no lockdowns, there's no shutdowns, everybody's uh, behaving as normal. Uh, you can see, if you look at, um, if you look at stories uh, online, you can find um, photographs of people sitting at restaurants, bars have not been closed, people are huddled together, there's no social distancing, there's nothing going on. Everything is normal in Sweden. And yes, some people are dying of the coronavirus, but it's no big deal. So... That is the story we're getting. So why can't we all just be like Sweden? Why can't we all be Swedes? That sounds like Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders has wanted us to be Swedes for a long time. But this is actually coming from a different constituency, that constituency that is not like the shutdowns and would like to see us, would like to see us uh, more open, uh, and, and less lockdowns, like less constraints on, on Americans. So let's start with the facts. We'd like to do that on this show. What's actually going on in Sweden? Is it true that Sweden is completely hands-off and the government's doing nothing? And the answer to that is No. <laughs> Usually the common perspective out there and the stuff that's being written is wrong and don't believe all the photographs even that you see in newspapers. It, it's not true that the Swedish government is completely hands-off. Um, it's also, I would argue, not true that the government of Sweden is doing the right thing. I think to a large extent the government, the government of Sweden is not doing what it should be doing um, overall. But let's start with this idea of uh, lockdowns. No, there are no lockdowns in Sweden. There is a recommendation from the government. The government of Sweden is treating its citizens as adults. They recommended social distancing to the population in Sweden. And Swedes, you know, Swedes kind of trust their governments. Uh, Swedes are, you know, people who tend to do what the government asks them to do. So Swedes tend to be fairly disciplined. So generally, there is a lot of social distancing going on in Sweden. Most people are working at home. Most people are not going out to restaurants. Restaurant business is down 70 to 80%. Now, it's better to make 20 30% than it is to make zero, but it's down 70 to 80%. People are not shaking hands. They're not hugging in the street. They're keeping a distance. Uh, as people interviewed for some stories I saw said, yes, you've got these photographs of people sitting huddled together, a few groups, but if the camera just swiveled a little bit, you would have seen empty squares and empty streets. People are staying home. 
but they're staying home because they choose to do so. They can be out in the street, but the government in Sweden is trusting its people to do the right thing. And doing the right thing in this pandemic is social distancing, and that's what they're doing. A big portion, it's my understanding, of Swedish workforce uh, uh, works from home anyway. They, they've, they've done, you know, tele, um, uh, teleconferencing, telecommuting, uh, to a large extent in many other countries. So uh, many people, it's not a big deal to be working at, at home. Of course, there are still many people that have lost their jobs. Sweden is facing a deeper recession than it did in 2008. The economy there is doing better than the rest of Europe, but still doing terribly. Sweden has shut down all its high schools, but kindergartens and primary schools are all open, which I think is great, and I've, I've been against the closing of schools all along. Um, Sweden is this middle ground of shutting down group uh, uh, events above 500, but not below 50. So... You know, large events are banned, but not the kind of size events. I think I think the uh, above 50 now. Yes, there aren't any congregation of more than 50 people. But of course, in the United States, in some places it's above two, and in others above 10. So Sweden has definitely taken a more laissez-faire approach than most of Europe and the United States. It's definitely allowed people to voluntarily decide how much social distancing to have. But you have to take into account the particular demographic and geography of Sweden. Sweden has one big city, Stockholm. And from my understanding, Greater Stockholm only has 850,000 people who live there. This is not London. It certainly is not New York. It is not LA. It is, by American standards, a small city. Spread out. Not a lot of multi-generational families living together. Mostly people living alone. Couples. Maybe with children. But you don't get grandparents, grandkids, parents living in the same household. Like you do in particularly low-income families in the United States. So, a very middle-class society. Very distant already in the sense that they live in separate households. A socially somewhat cold society. Not a lot of hugging, not a lot of kissing going on. I mean, romantic kissing, but not a lot of physical warmth between people like you would see in Italy or like you would see in the United States. So already social distancing is not that big of a deal for them. I hope I'm not insulting any Swedes right now. And the Swedes are doing what their government has asked. They're socially distancing for the most part. Um, so more dispersed population, a lot of people outside the city, a lot of people in the countryside, a lot of people in smaller villages, smaller towns. Only 10.5 million people in the entire country. 850,000 people in their biggest city. It's a very different demographic than the United States. And... The idea of people are disciplined, but to their credit, they have not shut down businesses. They have not used the curse of power of the state, and that's a good thing. Thumbs up to the Swedish model. So Sweden has, in one respect, in one respect, been better than the rest of Europe, but in another respect, it's just as bad. And that is Sweden does not seem to be doing a lot of testing. So the ideal, which I've talked about over and over again, of test, track, isolate, is not really being practiced that well in Sweden. Not a lot of testing going on. Not a lot of focus on testing, isolating, tracing. And I think as a consequence, probably more deaths than are necessary. So Sweden has had about 1,200 deaths on a population of 10.2 million. Uh, that proportion of about 1,000, uh, about 1,200 out of 10 million 
is lower than in some European countries like Italy and the United Kingdom, which have very high death rates. But it's definitely higher than countries very similar to Sweden, like Norway, Denmark, Finland, which have far, far lower death rates. So Norway only has 128 deaths with a population half the size of Sweden. Um, Where's Denmark? Denmark has 275 deaths, again, on a population about half the size of Sweden. So Sweden definitely has more deaths per capita. Uh, fewer, you know, uh, the United States has a lower death count than Sweden. The United States has 71 COVID deaths per 1 million of population versus, again, um, what is it, about 100 for Sweden per million in population. So Sweden is not performing spectacularly well in a death round. Now, you could argue, and you should argue, if you're a data guy and if you know data and you don't want data to be misused, that it's really hard to tell what this is going to be and what this is going to end up as. Maybe Sweden is a different point in the cycle. Maybe because Sweden is just a lot allowing people to be out there, get herd immunity before everybody else. And because of that, long-term deaths in Sweden will be significantly lower than long-term deaths in some of these other countries. All legitimate critiques and why it's very dangerous to come to definitive conclusions in the middle of a pandemic about the data, about the exact facts, about the exact consequences and outcomes. So we have to wait and see. Very hard to tell whether Sweden maybe is avoiding the cyclicality of this virus. Maybe in Sweden they'll have it and it'll go. And in other countries they'll have it, it'll go, it'll come back, it'll go because of the mandated social distancing and because we're not gaining herd immunity. So death toll in Sweden, all given all those caveats, is high. Economy marginally better off but not hugely so, still taking a major hit. Politically, very popular in Sweden not to mandate this. So overall, I would say Sweden got it mostly right. Have clear... Um, I, I, the thing I think Sweden does, I think again voluntarily, is it segregates its older population, which is relatively easy because again, they don't live with their kids. So it's easy to segregate, but segregate them and protect them. And I think they got that right. Make, make social distancing voluntary. Don't take kids out of school. And where was I going? Whoops, slipped out of my mind. Don't take kids out of school. And, um, you know, and, and count on people to voluntarily do the right thing and distance them from their grandparents. Make sure that older people are isolated. And then on top of that, what I would recommend Sweden do, what I've recommended everybody do, is test, isolate, uh, track and isolate. If Sweden did that in combination with these kind of voluntary policies, it would have the ideal model. By the way, South Korea, which did test, track, and isolate, South Korea unequivocally has a far lower death rate than Sweden, than the United States, than any country in Europe. It's still true that the model for this pandemic is South Korea. All right, so that's what I have to say about Sweden. Uh, good for the Swedes. I wish we were more like the Swedes. I wish we didn't have these authoritarian um, scriptures, these authoritarian... Um, you know, uh, 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 constraints on us that force us to socially distance. I wish they would rely on us as individuals to make the right choices for our own lives and that they would test, 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 test. But I'm not going to give my wish. <laughs> but that's certainly what we should be advocating for. But it's still true that the best model in the world is not Sweden. It's South Korea. South Korea had no mandated lockdowns had no travel bans, by the way, had no real restrictions, test, 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 test. I can't repeat myself enough. 
Okay, so I've got a bunch of questions. Um, I've got a bunch of questions from you guys today. I've got a bunch of questions from yesterday. And I've got some email questions. I want to take this one email question from Helen. Well, it's not a question. It's a statement, which I want to comment on because I think I see a lot of these, what I believe are confusions. Uh, and I want, to, I want to address them one by one. And she makes three points that she says are well-documented. She has on her Facebook page documentation for all of these. And I want to take them on. Uh, somebody said Taiwan's is the best model. Taiwan is very similar to the South Korean model. And I still think on scale, South Korea probably did a better job. But Taiwan, uh, Taiwan the same. Uh, um, very few travel bans. A lot of testing, a lot of isolating, a lot of tracking. So I'd say Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, and to some extent Hong Kong all had the same models. All should have been, should have been, had huge death rates. Should have been the forefront of damage caused by this and weren't because they did the right things. And again, those who, who, you know, the United States should learn from them rather than, oh, by the way, I, oh, I, oh, God, let me find this. I have to say something about, because you know me, I just have to say something about um, Trump. So Trump, on hearing about the, the Swedish, Swedish model, people asked him about it. This is his response. And again, I'm quoting Trump. Now, they talk about Sweden, but Sweden is suffering very gravely. They, and then he's about herd immunity. He said, they call it the hood. Sweden is suffering very, very badly. Are they? I mean, yeah, death rates are higher than the United States on per capita basis. But are they suffering so much? Is this the model that he has to condemn? Why? All right. Uh, let me just make a request. I hate to say no to money, but slow down, please, on the questions. Uh, I'm going to get to it, but I really want to get these other stuff out. I want to get yesterday's questions. I want to get the rest of today's questions, and I, I, I don't want to have to now pull questions into tomorrow and, and so on. Uh, so I want to cover all the questions today, so slow down on the question asking. All right, Helen says, Oh, here we go. Jason doesn't stop. I say, stop. Doesn't stop. <laughs> I know there's a time lag between my request and the time you hear it on YouTube, so that's fine. Um, oh, that's the wrong, wrong one. One second. Let me just do this. So Helen, Helen says uh, three points. So we're going to cover three points. The first one is, and I'm quoting for an email, the data shows that the number of deaths this year compared to last year and the year before are basically the same. That is, there's no increase in the number of deaths due to the coronavirus, which means there's no pandemic. The numbers are consistent with a normal flu season and the numbers of, for all deaths for this particular time of year. So I've seen this data, and, and, and to some extent, at least I've seen the data through early to mid-March, that's true. It looks like it's true. But here's where you have to really do some digging. And you have to really analyze the data. First, let me just say, if you look at the same data for Italy, deaths compared to last year and the year before, there is a massive, not a small, a massive spike up. Indeed, it's such a spike up that coronavirus by itself doesn't actually explain it. So they're going to have to really figure out what happened and what is causing this massive spike up because, again, corona doesn't seem to actually explain the whole spike upwards. So Italy, and uh, Italy is an aberration for this. Uh, and not an aberration, but Italy suggests that corona is real. And indeed, the number of deaths, the overflowing hospitals, the concentration of old people in those ICUs, Italy's never seen anything like it. No flu season, and even the worst flu seasons, did not hit Italy the way that this hit Italy. So you have to say that in America, it's just like the flu, but it's different in Italy, different in Spain, different in the UK right now, 
where it's hitting much harder than the flu. And again, causing real deaths that on an aggregate basis are much higher than previous years. So this is my suspicion. The coronavirus hits certain hot spots and doesn't hit others. And there's a whole question of why. And we, I'll talk about why I think that is. And it's speculation because I don't know. I don't think we have the science yet. There's no question that coronavirus hit New York in ways that the flu does not. And you can ask emergency room physicians who have no incentive to lie to you. This was their day-to-day -day work. And they will tell you that in certain hospitals, not in every hospital in New York, but in certain hospitals in New York, this was like nothing they've ever seen before in terms of the volume of people who came into the emergency room and the volume of deaths in the emergency room. They've never seen anything like it. It is not. These are... These are Emergency room physicians who have experienced many flu seasons. This is not the flu season. And you can see the same thing in New Orleans. And you can see the same thing right now in Detroit, I think. So it seems like the particular hotspot in which the, in Italy is a hotspot, certainly northern Italy. Spain has been a hotspot. The UK seems to be a hotspot. There's certain places that are hit very very, very hard by this. And where death rates, I think, when we look back, will be dramatically higher. Now, on average, across the country, they might not be higher. Partially because lockdowns slow the rate of death in other areas. For example, it's already been documented that violent deaths in New York have plummeted since the lockdown started. And that's true, I'm sure, in much of the country. Deaths caused by traffic accidents have plummeted throughout the country. Plummeted. And of course, huge numbers of people die from car accidents. Any car accidents, there are no car accidents. Because there are no cars. Well, I, I just saw there was one in some city. I can't remember where I read it. But anyway, there are very few car crashes. Because there are no cars in the street. Because nobody's driving. So it's very difficult to interpret the numbers. Now, I agree that the death statistics are overstated. I agree that there is a lot of panic and hysteria and fear mongering. I've said this from the beginning. But I think it's wrong to dismiss this as just the flu. It's not. It's something in additional to the flu. And again, ask emergency room physicians in New York, in New Orleans, in Detroit, whether this was a flu for them. Ask the people who actually saw the patients, treated the patients. So we won't know. And I've said this again from the beginning, and I emphasize, I've emphasized over and over again, be very careful how you use data. And, and I'm not talking about you specifically, but everybody on the web, everybody is citing numbers, citing data. I call bullshit on all of it. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know because, because we don't know what the death rate is going to look like for these months until we finish the months, until everything is reported. We have to take out car crashes and violent death out of the aggregate numbers to look at just deaths from disease. We'll have to take out things like suicide. We'll have to take out things like that might go up in this period of time. We'll have to take out, we'll have to control for a lot of different factors. We'll have to really dig into the numbers. We'll have to look at New York, separate from, let's say, the middle of the Midwest, where the coronavirus has not really hit. But they might still have lockdowns over there, so death rates might have gone down, which will balance out the death increases in New York. So you can't look at this in aggregate. You have to look at specific areas. 
So you have to really go in and analyze the numbers. But you can't, you can't, in the meantime, come to some conclusions. I've spoken firsthand to emergency room physicians in New York. I know that this is real. I also can look at the data, look at the numbers, look at the geography, and say it's real in certain hotspots. It doesn't seem to be having much of an impact elsewhere. I can also say it's real for some people, old people, people with pre-existing conditions, other people most likely to die, although about 45% of hospitalization are relatively young people under the age of 65. But they don't tend to die. The deaths are all concentrated, or mostly concentrated, not all, in people over 65. Again, not flu. That's not what the flu does. Kids die from the flu. Kids don't die. I mean, I know there's one in a thousand exceptions. But kids don't generally die from COVID. They do from the flu. This is a different disease. So don't buy the aggregate deaths. Don't yet start doing the seasonality. We haven't finished. We haven't probably got all the data from March. You're still going to get data from April. In six months, we can sit down with the data, dig deep, analyze it properly, and then we'll see. But people are jumping to conclusions way too early. Way too early. And I think the wrong conclusions. I mean, on both sides of the argument, people who think this is, oh, Armageddon, the end of the world, and people think this is nothing. Both are wrong. Number two, related to the above, since a specific date, all deaths regardless of cause have to be accounted as coronavirus death as per CDC or whatever agency is supposed to dictate these mandates. That means that if you died of a heart attack or cancer or even a car accident, but tested positive, For coronavirus, your death is recorded as caused by virus. Now, again, half true. Nobody who died from a car accident, I shouldn't say nobody. In general, if you die of a car car accident, your death will not be categorized as COVID if you test positive for COVID. But it is true that people who die and test positive for COVID, the inclination is to so to mark the death down as a COVID death. In addition, people who haven't tested positive for COVID, but whose symptoms seem consistent with COVID, that is, they weren't tested, people who haven't been tested, are marked down as COVID deaths. In New York, if you go to the New York data, again, data, data is your friend, if you're willing to go look for it, you can get the New York data, and the New York data for deaths is now split into two. Deaths of people who tested positive for COVID versus the deaths of people who didn't test positive for COVID but assumed to be COVID-related deaths because they had the symptoms. Nobody's hiding this. The data's there. There's no conspiracy to knock the numbers up. I mean, there's incentives for local politicians to knock the numbers up, but there's no... Fast conspiracy. All the data, on oh, a lot of data, not as much as I would like, is available publicly. You can go look at it. But let me also make the argument that we're underreporting COVID deaths. For example, people who die at home, not in the hospital, from COVID, are not reported as COVID deaths. But they have all the symptoms, and some of them test positives. And until recently, they're not being reported. So they're, they're going to have to adjust those numbers. And my guess is they're going to adjust some up and they're going to adjust some down. And over time, we will get a much clearer picture of the actual numbers. The actual numbers. Again, don't jump to conclusions. And it's not true that as per the CDC, it's just not true that the CDC is telling doctors you have to classify deaths of people who test positive for COVID as COVID deaths. That is a decision made by a medical examiner at a hospital making the best assessment he can under very extreme conditions because there are a lot of people dying in spite of the claim that this is just a flu. A lot of people dying. 
and he has to make a, he has to diagnose and he talks to doctors and he examines the dead person and he makes a, an argument. He makes a determination of what the cause of death was. And they're doing it based on their standards, not some CDC dictate on how to do it. And it changes over time. Puerto Rico changed in the middle how they categorize deaths. And I'm sure in New York they will change, and I'm sure in New York to some extent they'll go back and rethink this, and, they, and we will know more as time goes on. So no, I don't buy the deaths are, are dramatically overstated. They're probably somewhat overstated in some areas and somewhat understated in other areas. There are whole parts of this country where people are not being tested, and people are dying probably from corona, and they're not even being tested. So they're not considered corona deaths. They're, they're, they're deaths from cancer and heart disease and so on. But they probably wouldn't have died today if not for corona. Now, it's generally a problem to determine the cause of death for somebody in their 80s. It's not easy. Somebody's 87 and they've got the coronavirus, but they've also got 300 other things going wrong with them because they do when they were that old. What was the cause of death? COVID is not a bad cause, given that it probably triggered this particular day, their death. They might have died two weeks later from something else, but on this particular day, COVID is probably what triggered them. So again, data, evaluate it, look carefully, don't jump to conclusions, realize what you know and you don't know. Biggest difficulty in being objective is to realize what you know and what you don't know. To realize what the data is actually telling you and what it's not telling you. To realize when people are telling you, people are great. Every article I read that has a definitive answer, they know exactly what's going on. I'm suspicious of. Because I don't think anybody knows exactly what's going on. Because I look at the raw data, and I know data, and it's hard to know exactly what's going on. We need a lot of time. We need a lot of studies. We're going to have a lot of medical articles in the next couple of years diagnosing what's happened, and we'll slowly figure it out. But we know it's not the flu. We know people are dying from it. We don't know exactly how many, but many, many more than die usually. At least in, play, in the hot spots, not everywhere, in the hot spots, which is right now, was New York, it seems to have faded in New York, New Orleans, Detroit, maybe a couple of other places. And in Europe, Italy, Spain, UK, primarily. Three, some very reputable doctors are saying that the respirators, or whatever they are called, are being used improperly. First, it was reported that doctors got much better results if patients were placed on their stomachs rather than on their backs. While, uh, while on the respirators. Then other doctors said the respirators were actually killing people rather than helping them. But these were procedures recommended by the CDC, and all doctors had to follow them, or else. Even though some of them were aware of the use of the respirators was the worst thing to do to use during these particular circumstances, which means that a lot of death could have been avoided, but that the madness of the government agency telling doctors how to proceed, which in the end were totally wrong. I disagree with this again a lot, and I've read the same testimonies. <laughs> Who discovered that patients do better on their stomach? Some patients, by the way, not all patients, some patients. Doctors did by experimenting at the risk of their lives because they violated the guidelines of the CDC. No, the CDC provides guidelines in this case. Now, I'm not trying to justify government intervention in medicine, but it, I'm just trying to be accurate here. The CDC has guidelines. We need guidelines. Hospitals would create guidelines. Medical profession would create guidelines. When you have a new disease, it's good to have somebody who suggests the treatment. Respirators, given the type of disease, seemed like a rational, the rational answer. Doctors then experimented. They tried to turn them on their stomachs. That helped for some, not others. They tried to take them off the respirators. Helped for some. For a lot of people, it didn't. They tried to lower the pressure that the respirator was working on. Helped a lot. It turned out that the pressure recommendation was too high. But who did all these tinkerings? Doctors did. Why? 
because the CDC didn't mandate that people go on respirators. That was the recommendation because the disease looked like it was a disease that respirators typically help with, a, a typical pneumonia. And doctors experimented and they figured out, no. There are other ways to treat this. And, and yes, they still need respirators, by the way. Many, many, many patients still need respirators. It just turns out that they respond better to the respirators if they're not set on very high pressure of the oxygen going into the lungs. At lower pressures, patients respond better. At least that's what I've read. Same with if you move the patient around. So different areas of the lung are, are in a sense, being pressurized. That's good for patients. Some patients do better without a respirator. So again, pay, pay, doctors are experimenting. And the same, by the way, is happening with drugs. You know, Trump keeps pounding this malaria drug. First of all, why is the president of the United States of America, have, why does the president have an opinion about a drug, any drug? Even if it's the real cure, it's none of his business. He knows nothing. He has an instinct for these things, he tells us. The President of the United States should stay silent when it comes to treatment. Now, it turns out the malaria drug is being used extensively by doctors all over the world. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it makes patients worse. Lots of other drugs are being treated. Tuberculosis drugs. It turns out the tuberculosis immunization vaccines for tuberculosis seem to have a positive impact. I think, again, some studies say there's the antiviral drug that Gilead has, put, uh, has that is showing some promising results for some patients. There's other medications that people are trying, experimenting with. And who's doing this? Once they get a, you know, it's pathetic they need permission from the FDA. But the FDA has given a lot of these drugs permission to be tried. Once they get that permission, which they got early on, doctors are experimenting. They don't have one treatment that they have to give a patient. They're trying different things. Well, blood plasma, I think, I don't know that we've seen any trials yet of blood plasma. But one of the most promising treatments is to take plasma from people who've already had the coronavirus, who have antibodies, and inject that plasma into people who are really, really, really sick and therefore boost the body's immune system against the virus. We will see if that works. All these things are interesting. But it's doctors on the ground. There might be recommendations. But at the end of the day, as long as they're not going against the, uh, using a drug the FDA has not yet approved for testing, and the FDA luckily in this case has approved a lot of drugs for testing, uh, they can use off-label, doctors can use, they can use uh, for compassionate purposes, they can use all kinds of things. Again, I am not, I am not trying to justify the FDA at all. Henry Mullen says, no driving, plenty of driving in Southern California. There's more driving in Southern California than in other places. I can tell you Puerto Rico is like a ghost town, and, and I've seen pictures of New York, nobody's driving in New York and other places. And that's why I say, you're not going to get good death statistics and let you get them geographically and until you control for other factors. And maybe people have done that. Maybe I'm wrong about all this. But I, am, I have not seen the data controlled for properly. And until we do, we won't know. So stop, and I've said this all along, stop being definitive about these things. It's, it, it's, uh, it's hard. I, I think corona is way overstated. I think the death rate will turn out to be Closer to the flu than to what they're claiming today, which is over, you know, 2%. I think it'll be well under 1% of people infected get death. I think there are a lot more people infected today in the United States than there were before. And one of the big questions, so let me, let me talk about this, and then I'll take the Super Chat questions. Thanks, Helen, for the email. Why is this hitting some places so hard and other places not so much? Why is this really bad in New York? but not in the Midwest, not even in Southern California. It's bad in L.A., but not terrible. And I think it has to do with the number. Why is it bad in Italy, but not so bad in Germany? Why is it bad in China, but not bad in Thailand? 
And I think there are a lot of factors. Here are some, again, I'm not being definitive here. This is my reading of the data, and we will see. We will see. Why are fewer people infected? So I think it has to do, one, with culture. The warmer places culturally, the more people hang out with one another, the more they're in each other's faces, in each other's lives, in each other's homes, the more infection there is. Take Italy, Spain, Germany, exact opposite. People keep a distance, just culturally. In Italy, they don't. In Italy, grandparents live in the same homes with their children and grandchildren. Germany, less so. Sweden, even less. The more you have intergenerational families, the more closely knit societies are, the closer they live together, the closer they interact, the closer they, you know, they, they, they relate to one another on a day-to-day -day basis, the more likely it is to get infected. So you get more infections in societies like that. And then the higher the density. So London, New York, very highly dense places. You get high infection rates. Dispersed places like California. People live in single-family homes for the most part, far away from each other. They're not one on top of the other. Again, less intergenerational. Portugal, on the other hand, is a counterexample where it's a very warm society, multi-generational, but not a lot of infection. So, again, these things maybe have to be tested and have to, you, there has to be hypothesis around this. So, culture, I think, is an impact. Density has an impact. I hear that in Portugal, the more dense area around Lisbon is more infection. The less dense area in the north there's less infection. That makes sense. But big cities. Right? Three people are being up Hong Kong. Three. The regime the country adopted. Again, North Korea should have been massive infections. Very high density. But they had the right strategy of isolation. The people who had it very early on and very quickly. But also, North Korea's culturally are more distant from one another. They're not the hugging, kissing culture, right? I'll get to Hong Kong. There's another thing that is in Hong Kong favor I'll get to in a minute. So culture, population density, I think are important factors. I think weather is probably a factor. Now, there's no proof of this, and we'll wait and see. But I still think weather has a factor, and I go by this by looking at the map. Looking at the map of the hot spots. And there are very few hot spots in hot countries. Hong Kong wasn't a hot spot. Singapore wasn't a hot spot. Some of the, the first coronavirus infection discovered outside of China was in Vietnam and then in Thailand. And yet, we don't hear about Vietnam and Thailand having thousands of deaths because they're very warm tropical cultures, uh, countries. So it could be very much climate. Japan, which is cold, not warm, super dense, but people are standoffish. But also, they wear masks and, and they tested and isolated very early on. So again, you've got all these combination of things that you're going to have to figure out what dominates, what's important. Indonesia, very warm culture. High number of, 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 of uh, uh, relatively, but huge population. What is it? The fourth largest population on planet Earth is in Indonesia. So per population, very low numbers, but lots of islands. So maybe didn't transmit quite as well, more dispersed population. So lots of these factors go into that. Right? Lots of these factors go into who's going to get it. Oh, and the, the, the last one I want to mention. Well, related. How old your population is. Italy, very old population. But so is Japan. Japan's actually older than Italy. So something is controlling for Japan. Testing and isolation. But also distancing, which is natural. 
I mean South Korea, not North. Anytime I said North, I've n- I never meant North Korea throughout the show. So anytime I said North, I meant South. <coughs> oh, there's my dry cough. So not just, not, Germany is old, but not quite as old as Italy. But it's not, but this relates to Germany, my next point. But it's not just the, uh, the age of the population. It's the entry point of the virus. Did the virus enter with young people or did it enter with old people? In Italy, it ended and hit old people very quickly. In Germany, it ended with young people. They were tested and isolated, and it never got. It never got to the old people. Well, it never is a big thing. It didn't get to the old people quite as badly. So where did it, in South Korea, it entered through this religious sect, which is isolated from the rest of South Korea. So it was heavy in the sect, didn't spread as much for the rest of the country. So the entry point is really, really crucial. But what's interesting, for example, in the U.S., is the entry points in the United States were Washington State and California. And yet the real hot spot is in New York City. I think because of population density, and I think because Washington State probably responded earlier, faster, and more effectively than New York did. So you've got a lot of things going on. And again, this is where you're going to have to look back a year or two from now and figure out what really happened. It's very hard to tell in the midst of it. But we know what strategies work. Isolating. You're testing and isolating and tracking. Work. Isolating the old people. Works. Social distancing. Ideally, voluntary, works. Those are the things that work. None of that involves shutting down cities for long periods of time, shutting down the economy, constraining us to our homes, police state. None of it justifies. None of it. New York City, by the way, got the virus from Europe, not from Asia, which is interesting. And, and maybe, I don't think they found mutation of the virus in New York versus the virus in Washington State. But it would be interesting to find out. So there's a lot going on. And then, of course, Jennifer reminds me, there's there's, there's the medical condition. Californians, generally, are more healthy than New Yorkers. They smoke less. They exercise more. They're less obese. Detroit has a lot of diabetes, a lot of obesity. Poor people, generally. Uh, have more pre-existing conditions than wealthy people. California, particularly those regions that were exposed to the virus initially, are relatively well off, relatively healthy, relatively take care of themselves. Californians, as Jack says, eat more avocados. There you go. That is the cure. So... um, Live in California if you don't want to get coronavirus. All right, let's get to your questions. We got a lot of them and not a lot of time. All right. By chance, have you read Jonathan Fenby's History of Modern China? If so, do you recommend it? I haven't read it, so I can't recommend it. I I mentioned the books I recommended last time, right? Um, How China Became Capitalist and the Biography of Deng Xiaoping. Have you played the board game Monopoly? How well does it represent capitalism? I have played the board game Monopoly. I used to play it a lot in high school. Um, It was my favorite game to play in high school. And then I I also played it in my late 20s with a group of friends. We had a blast playing it. Um, I I really enjoyed it. I'll tell you the twist that I made on Monopoly. But no, it doesn't represent capitalism. It has nothing to do with capitalism. There's no similarities between it and capitalism at all, except maybe in that phase of the game where you're trading and making deals. But it is a very Marxist view of capitalism. You own land and you extract land rents from the land. There's no creation, there's no production, there's no innovation, there's no entrepreneurship, there's, there's nothing. There's no value, there's no wealth. There's just, you know, building hotels on land. Right? So Monopoly is nothing like capitalism, but it is a fun game. Now, the innovation I and my friends made to the game of Monopoly, 
which made the game like a thousand times better and more interesting. And which as an adult, I appreciated even more and enjoyed even more. So I've always, whenever I play Monopoly, this is the way I play it. And this is the innovation. So you know how in Monopoly you start out and you roll dice and you go around the board picking up properties. And you start with like $2,000 and you spend that money to buy the properties. And the price you pay for the properties is whatever price is listed on the board when you land on that property. Well, what makes it much more fun, much more strategic, much more interesting, much more of a mind game is instead of going around randomly landing on properties and buying them at a randomly determined price by the board, instead what you do is you auction the properties off before you ever start playing the game. So you take all the properties, you stack them up, and you shuffle them. You shuffle them. And then you start flipping them open. And every property you flip, there is a bidding process that goes on. And you can strategically decide what you want to bid on, how much you want to buy a property. So a property that might go for $200, suddenly, if you play the game strategically right, might have much greater value. Suddenly, its value might jump to 1000 and you might see bidding on a relatively cheap property go through the roof because it's a strategic asset now because you've got a whole strategy around which properties you're accumulating. So it becomes a completely different game. The fun of it is in the bidding. Then once you bid, all the properties are distributed. Then you start playing the game. Then you start playing the game. Then you put the, and then the, 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 the chance aspect is on which properties you land. Also, you have to strategically consider how much you bid on the properties so you have enough money left over to buy houses and to buy hotels so that you can charge rent. So after the bidding, you start going around. And that's when the, the game, and, and actually the games are shorter because the real winners can be determined almost immediately after the bidding happens. And of course, after the bidding, you can trade. Anytime in the game, you can trade. You can get any deals anybody's willing to do. So it's a complete laissez-faire monopoly game. So you guys should really pick it up and, and try it out and let me know what you think. Okay, somebody asked, what's your opinion on usury? I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm very pro-usury. I think usury is fantastic. I don't think the world, modern world, could exist without usury. Usury just means, in its traditional sense, charging interest on money, lent. So you, I, I give you a loan, and I charge you interest on the money until you pay me back. Interest is what drives much of kind of the, 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 the financial world, which makes possible production, innovation, entrepreneurship, capitalism. So I'm a huge fan of usury. And indeed, I have a whole book dedicated to usury called The Moral Defense of Finance. In it, there is an essay called On the Morality of Usury. And I talk about the history of usury and why usury is moral and why an economy with no usury, otherwise without interest on debt, is a non-functioning economy. And since I believe in laissez-faire, I believe you should be allowed to charge whatever interest you can get away with. It would be great if your timelines were published somewhere. I learned some things and would be good to have a reference. Great stuff. I don't have the time. I'm happy for one of you to take on the project of publishing the timeline and putting it out there. I don't have the time to do it. Sorry. I appreciate the request because I think you're right. It would be valuable. Do you honestly believe most Americans are good people? Or are we surrounded by narcissists and nihilists? Ah, I don't think they're narcissists and nihilists. Let's not exaggerate. Most people are, um, most people are just simple. Simple in their wants in life. Simple in their ability to conceptualize the world, simple in their values, and they live simple lives. And they, 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 it's easy to get them all riled up like a Trump or Bernie Sanders does about particular emotionalist issues because they're not thinkers. They're not thinkers. They, they watch Fox News. They watch CNN. They, they basically are conventional. 
There's some that are narcissists and nihilists. They tend to be the intellectuals. They tend to be the they tend to be wealthier. They tend to be more successful in clothes. They tend to be the people guiding the culture. But the culture is not dominated by them. I still think most Americans are basically good people. But narrowly good. Good in that they, you know, they don't want to harm anybody and they want to live their lives and they generally want to be left alone. But bad in the sense that they're unthinking about more abstract issues and about the world. Americans are losing their sense of life and have lost much of it as Ayn Rand said they would. She warned of this in the 60s and 70s and, and Leonard Peikoff warned of this in the 2000s where he said Americans have basically abandoned their Americanism, their individualism, their goodness, their deep-seated goodness and, and what made them different from all other people, that they were losing or had lost much of that. That was in a famous speech that Leonard Peikoff made called Americans versus America. Great title. And uh, um, you can still listen to that speech on YouTube. Look for Americans versus America. Travel introduces a linear term in infection rate, but community spread is exponential. True. Uh, that's why travel bans are not effective and slow infections down a little bit, but not dramatically. Do you think that the U.S. should annex Taiwan if Taiwan people ask for it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, I think generally a, a free people uh, who wants to be annexed to the United States and that are basically free and they have a, a culture that you could imagine uh, becoming a part of an American culture. I mean, up to a limit. You don't want to annex the whole world. Yeah, and, and there's, you, you know, Taiwan is far. So that would be my only concern. But it's not that much further than Hawaii, although I might have my geography wrong. Um, I mean, geography would play a role. Like, I wouldn't annex Israel even if Israel wanted. It's too far, too messy, too disaster over there. So, but I would annex Canada. <laughs> Why is testing not widely available? What is the government saying and what is the truth? It's not widely available because they haven't allocated the resources to it. I mean, we had a $2.2 trillion stimulus package. And before that, we had two other stimulus packages. Not enough money was allocated in either one of them. It's not clear how much testing the federal government wants to do versus the state government versus private. There's no clear leadership. There's no clear agenda. There's no clear strategy. So if they put the money aside, if they developed a strategy, if they rallied private companies, private labs, private hospitals, and then coordinated with the states, you could have had a significant testing that would have been done primarily by private companies, funded by the government, because pff, that's what we do in America, I guess. Uh, I mean, in a laissez-faire capitalist economy, it would be funded by insurance companies, but here probably funded by the government. Um, and it would, have been, it would have been good. But it's not. And what is the government saying? It's saying, we're testing plenty. We've got lots of tests. There's no problem with testing. That's what Trump keeps saying. He said that a month ago when the problems with testing were staring us in the eye. You know? I mean, he lies blatantly without blinking, and some of you believe him. Um, so testing, it was, they're saying there's plenty of tests and we've done enough testing. Clearly a lie and untrue. I mean, some of the problems are, um, Abbott Labs developed a new test, a new testing methodology, very quick, very easy. The government won't pay them enough for it. So they're losing money on it. So they had to convince, took them weeks to convince the government to pay them enough to make a profit because they were a private company. And when now that the government has agreed, finally, I think today I read, they've agreed to pay them enough, Abbott can produce gazillions of tests. The other thing is, there's shortages, again, because there's no pricing mechanism to determine this. 
because the government's not willing to pay enough. So there's not enough reagents. There's not enough swabs. And then the government is banned in home testing. Companies developed in home testing, and the government banned it. So there's a million little reasons why testing is behind. But the primary reason, the primary reason is no leadership. Primary reason is no leadership. <laughs> Somebody says, hey, Yohan, have you heard of a guy named Joe Rogan? What do you think, I hide, I, I live under a rock or something? First I've heard of Joe Rogan. You should try to get on, man. Man, have I tried to get on. I've emailed Joe. I've texted Joe. I've twittered with Joe. Uh, Dave, Dave Rubin on Joe Rogan's show, interviewed by Joe, said, hey, you should have Yohan Brook on. Sent an email to Joe Rogan asking him to have me on. Joe Rogan does not want to have me on. So that's it. It's Joe doesn't want to have me on. All right, um, here's a question. EU competition chief warns that the pandemic has made companies vulnerable to foreign bids. Foreign companies might buy European companies. The end of the world is here. European countries should buy stakes in companies to stave off threat of Chinese takeovers. The EU competition chief has said, as Brussels steps up plans to protect businesses fighting for survival during the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, he says, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on this. It seems like the virus will soon uh, be the least of our worries in comparison to what the EU bureaucrats have in store for us. I think that's right. I think the real danger is the power grab of politicians, not the virus. I think, um, I think this is a good example of that. Um, now, if it's a Chinese government that is trying to buy your companies, okay. But even then, the response is not to have your government buy your company. But if private Japanese, Chinese companies want to buy European companies, they should. They'll probably make them better, more efficient, more productive. The danger is when European governments start buying up European companies, then you've got socialism and and we know how that ends that will be a disaster but yes the real danger in the world today is government power and the government using that power or, or expanding that power and when the crisis ends further expanding the power and taking more and more power that is the real danger that what scares me the most much more than the virus itself i recently reread the fountainhead and i don't completely understand the essence of gail Wynand. Who is he philosophically? Why does he give in and choose the path he does? Instead, he be why not doesn't he become another Howard Rourke? Who is the closest real-life example to Gail Ga uh, Wynand? So Gail Wynand is the man of ability, of competence, who sold out his soul to El Zotui very early on, who seeks power rather than values, but is competent, knows how to do it, knows what to do, appreciates and admires Howard Rourke, appreciates and admires success, but is so negative about human beings, so negative about life, is convinced that the only way he can be successful, in spite of seeing how it work, is by power and control and compromise. And at the end, he is so afraid to lose his power that he gives in to Ellsworth Tui. He can't live up to being Howard Rook. He doesn't have the guts. He's not brave enough. He's not courageous enough, he doesn't have enough integrity to become Howard Rourke. He's psychologically impossible for him to do it because at a too young of an age, he gave up. He handed a portion of his mind, a portion of his values to others to determine for him. Now, I think most businessmen have Gail Wynand as part of them. If you think about the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, 
admirable businessmen who achieve great things, who are amazingly productive. And yet when it comes to anything conceptual, when it comes to anything political, when it comes to anything philosophical, fold, give up, accept the wishes of the intellectuals, the politicians, the intellectuals, cultural, so-called superiors. So I think most of the CEOs in our world, all the CEOs who are productive geniuses, build companies, produce stuff, but somehow can't give up on God. And everything is determined morally from a moral perspective or other perspectives by this commitment to God, even though they don't live that life in their business life. So there's an element of Gail Weinert in almost all businessmen today, unfortunately. All right, about half a million Zoom accounts have been sold online recently. So if anyone uses it, I would suggest changing passwords. Yes, I mean, massive um, security breaches in Zoom, uh, lots of problems with Zoom. Uh, Google has banned its employees from using Zoom. Others uh, have, um, uh, other companies have, have banned the use of Zoom because it is so, um, it's so leaky, uh, security-wise. Real, real problems, so be careful. Uh, Greg mentions that um, Ankar Gatte has an excellent essay on the characters, uh, on the motivation of characters in, uh, in The Fountainhead, in Robert Mayhew's uh, book on The Fountainhead, es uh, uh, Essays on The Fountainhead, uh, in which Ankar has an essay on the characters, and he has a whole section in Gail Wynand, which is excellent. So if you really want to dig into Gail's, or any of the characters in the Fountainhead, uh, motivations, uh, Ankar has an excellent essay on that. So uh, I don't think anything I said contradicted it, but you'll get much, much better, deeper analysis of Gail Wynand in Ankar's essay. Did Margaret Thatcher rely on religious right the way Reagan did in order to win? What was Ayn Rand's ev evaluation of Thatcher? No, uh, the UK doesn't have really a religious right. I mean, I don't think she, I mean, I don't think she ever pandered to religion that I know of. I mean, there is some religiosity in England, but it's mild and tame and insignificant as compared to the religious right in the United States and Ronald Reagan's pandering to it. So, no, Thatcher was much, much better. I don't know. I don't think Ayn Rand was impressed by Thatcher it's one area where I disagree with Ayn Rand. I'm very impressed with Thatcher in comparison to almost any leader in the Western world since World War II. I think she is the most impressive in the last, what, 60 years, um, 70 years. So uh, Thatcher would be head and shoulders about anybody else that I know who's led a Western country. Um, you know, the United States and UK, let's say, because I don't know all the other leaders since World War II. Um, a little off topic, but could you briefly go over the errors of UBI? Oh my God. I've done whole shows of the UBI, so the best thing is to, go to in YouTube, do a search, Iran Brook UBI, and you'll find a couple of shows that I did, and I did a thing criticizing Andrew Yang, Yang and, and a whole thing. But basically, the, the evil of a UBI is that it is morally offensive. It basically assumes that some people cannot make a living, and I think that's offensive, and it assumes that I owe them a living by taxing me and giving it to them, which I think is offensive. But I also have given compliments to UBI in the sense that of, of all the redistribution systems, it's better than welfare. So if you could promise me that we got rid of all welfare, all government health care, all government programs to help the poor, and replace it with one check, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, everything, welfare, food stamps, all of these things all went away. All the bureaucracies went away. Everything went away. And all we did was give everybody one check to replace them. I'd be for it as a, as a, as a means to getting rid of all welfare forever, right? but as a, as a way in that, to move in that direction. But that's not what Yang was proposing. It's not what anybody is proposing. Anybody is proposing. So 
Um, but that's the kind of UBI, the only kind of UBI I would support, and I support it only as a mechanism to get rid of all the welfare. Have you read some deaths are being recorded as COVID without a test verification? Yes. And New York is actually reporting those deaths that were verified COVID and those deaths that were not. So you can actually get the numbers. And it's, it's a large number that weren't tested. But again, the determination is being done not by politicians. The determination is not being done by the CDC. The determination is not being done by Trump or Cuomo or anybody like that. The determination is done by doctors and medical examiners at hospitals. And of all the people in the world to trust making those determinations, I trust doctors and medical examiners more than anybody else. So are the numbers going to be messy? Absolutely. Is there a systematic bias in favor of COVID? Maybe, but I don't think it's anywhere as bad as you guys think it is. Will I still be going to my first Ocon in June? I'm not allowed to say, but let me just say, I think it's unlikely. Not, not because I have inside information. Just because I can't imagine the city of Austin letting us have an event with 500 people in June. And I think that a lot of the people coming will be afraid to come. So I suspect it's going to be delayed. I don't know until when... And I don't know how exactly, I think still in Austin, but I, I'm hoping because I'm, I'm waiting. I've got my travel plans. I've got everything set. I'm hoping that it will be, um, uh, the announcement will come out very soon because I'd like to know because I've got to change all my tickets and change all my plans for the summer based on it, particularly if it's rescheduled. Uh, loved the timeline yesterday. Great job. Thank you. I, I, that was a good show. I think people liked it. Although I got my usual people who came after me. But yeah, I thought that was an info data filled show that I think is helpful for you to get a context and perspective and what has happened uh, over time. Oh my God. Anu is on Facebook. I hope I didn't say anything uh, out of line regarding Ocon. Anu's in charge of Ocon. So the last word regarding Ocon has to come from her. But I didn't give a last word. I just said, you'll hear soon. Um, I have a question around people's ethnicity. Isn't it wrong when it comes, becomes part of their character identity? Yes. I think ethnicity from a biological, from a genetic perspective is meaningless. And uh, I, I don't care if a person's ethnicity. Well, now, some people relate culturally to a particular ethnic group. And, you know, there's something about that. You grow up in a particular culture. You're affiliated with the songs, with the food, with the atmosphere, whatever. Up to a point, it, you know, you can't affiliate with the bad parts of the culture. So there's some horrible parts of a culture that you don't want to affiliate with. But I think ethnicity generally as a means to evaluate people is wrong, evil even. I think the only reason ethnicity might come into play is when um, it's medical. At different ethnic groups do have different DNAs and as a consequence do have different susceptibilities to certain diseases and to certain medical conditions. And it's relevant medically. It's not relevant in terms of a person's character, in terms of whether somebody you should love, befriend, you know, have an affiliation with an association with a business relationship, all of that, the ethnicity is irrelevant. Have you watched HBO's The Plot Against America? If so, your thoughts. Does it have a parallel with today's politics like Trump? No, I haven't watched it, so I don't know. Sorry. Um, is it a good sign that people in North Carolina and Michigan are protesting these lockdowns? Absolutely. I think it's a good sign, as long as they're not advocating for some conspiracy theories about coronavirus or that it doesn't exist or it's exactly like the flu. Or, you know, as long as they're really protesting... The, 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 the nature of government oppression. For example, in Michigan, uh, things are really bad in Detroit. And you could argue, given the situation, that you might want to have a short-term lockdown in certain areas in Detroit. The idea that the whole state of Michigan needs to go in lockdown is absurd and ridiculous. So good for them for protesting, but it's also important for them to have the nuance. Not to come across as what is it, coronavirus deniers, right? There is such a thing as coronavirus. It is deadly. How deadly, we don't know exactly, but it is deadly. It's certainly deadly to your grandmother, very deadly to your grandmother. So um, some caution needs to be taken exactly 
how much caution it depends on the place and depends on how badly the government has handled it to this point the sooner the government handle it well the less bad measures they need to take if they handle it real well then they don't have to take bad measures at all in terms of lockdowns and things like that is there a point at which risk statistically is high enough to render an activity a disvalue i.e. surfing absolutely <laughs> absolutely but for whom is important like I wouldn't surf I wouldn't skydive partially because I just have fear of heights but it's not a kind of risk I want because I wouldn't enjoy it but some people love skydiving my wife likes paragliding she, she's only done it you know uh, uh, in tandem with a, with a guide but she loves jumping off of cliffs and floating in the air I mean I think that's and I love my wife dearly I think that's nuts right I wouldn't bungee jump. But if you love it, and if you understand the risks, and if you calculate the risks, and if the risks are not insane, like some things objectively nuts. I, I can't think of what right now. You know, driving down the I-5 in, in California uh, at 150 miles an hour, as I see sometimes people do, you're going to kill yourself or you're going to kill somebody else. The probability is very high. It's just stupid. And you're endangering other people. So it's a disvalue. Now, I love driving fast. To put, put that guy on a track where he's only risking his own life and, and he can control the risk and it's, it's just a track, and then great. So it has to be within the context of your values. I wouldn't want to tell people you can't do that because it's too risky. They have to make that call for themselves as long as they're not endangering other people. And if they are endangering other people, then the difficulty is, and this is where you need objective law, is how much are they, uh, how much are they um, you know, putting the, the other people's lives in danger? How can I quantify that? Can I quantify that? And if I can quantify that, at what point is the endangering such that they should be stopped? Not easy answers. This is why you need a legislature. This is, by the way, you need a government. It's to answer questions like that. And it's not bad to have state governments. It's not bad to have federalism where questions like that might get different answers in different states and we can see what works better. And maybe different states have different... Well, no, but we can test it. We can try it out. And we can self-select. So there's certain elements that are going to... Laws are going to be different in different states. Some laws not, right? If the state is violating individual rights, the federal government will mandate they stop. But as long as within the context of protecting rights, there is a lot of flexibility. And states would do it differently in different places. And you could choose to live in, in different places based on where you felt comfortable. And you could also, and states could look at one another and see what tends to work or not. So, for example, uh, laws about risky behavior are the kind of things that could be different between states. What's the best way to become more first-handed in your daily life? That's a great question. I'd encourage everybody to listen to Leonard Peikoff's course, two courses, two courses I would encourage you to listen to. One is Understanding Objectivism, which I think really teaches you not, it, it, it goes over the errors objectivists make in terms of thinking, which first-handedness, second-handedness falls into this. And then the other is objectivism through induction, where he teaches you how to induce, or at least understand what induction, how induction applies to your philosophical knowledge and to the knowledge of your principles. But I'd say how to be a first-handed thinker in day-to-day -day life. Facts, facts, facts. Reality. And this goes, you know, just because I said something doesn't mean it's true. Even if I sounded really, really convincing. And even if I yelled it. Even if I showed a graph and gave you some numbers. Now, if you've listened to me for a while 
and then gone and thought about what I've said and examined it and tested the data and checked for yourself and read some other sources and come to the conclusion, yeah, it sounds like Iran's right. And if you've done it over and over and over again, it's an okay assumption to make, yeah, he's been right in the past, he's probably right now. But to make it your knowledge, to make it truly convincing to you, to make it so you can then go out and argue the same point, you have to, to some extent, recreate what I've done. You have to go and read about the topic, look at some numbers, look at the data, and be convinced yourself. I can guide, I can help, I can point you in the right direction. I can't think for you. So to be first-handed means to think for yourself. To think for yourself means to access the data, the facts, reality, integrate it across your different knowledge, across the things you know. And figure it out for yourself. Figure it out for yourself. Now, again, I'm an expert, so you want to use me as a reference point. And on some things that are not that important to you, you can, you can, just, you can agree with me. Just realize that you're agreeing with me. You don't really understand the point. I often do this with Leonard. I go, that sounds right. I know I don't completely know why it's right. But it's Leonard Peikoff, so I'm sure it's right. And then if I really need that knowledge, if I feel like I really need it, then I'll go and figure it out for myself. I don't have time right now, for example, right? So you have to prioritize. You can't do it all knowledge, right? And at some point, if the knowledge is very, very specialized, you're not going to do it. So when I go to the doctor and he says stuff, I want him to explain to me in words that I can understand. I want him to show me on the MRI what he is seeing. But I don't really know. But So I try to understand. I do my research online. And I get a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth opinion, depending on how serious the condition is. And I try to integrate all that knowledge. And even then, I know I don't know. But I also know that given uncertainty, I have to make a decision. And I based it on the best available information I have. Some expressing sadness at missing sports, restaurants, the beach, etc. A shame because people are dying. Why is it good to express pain in response to death, but not in response to loss of life, of living? A absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I am sad because I can't go to restaurants. I can't go to the beach. I can see the beach. I can go walk a little bit by it. Although I, I did go to the beach a few days ago. And I am going to the beach on Saturday, but don't tell anybody because I'm breaking the law. But... Of course you should say you're sad. When you lose a value, your values are not measured in comparison to other people's. You don't lose your values because other people have lost bigger values. Your values are your values. And yes, other people dying is sad. But not going to restaurants is sad too. And in some circumstances, sadder. I miss basketball. We, you know, the Celtics would be in the finals right now playing the Lakers. It would be a classic, a classic series. And we don't get to see that. And that's horrible. Right? So I'm sad about missing sports, about restaurants, about the beach, about all these things. I'm also sad about people dying. One does not zero out the other. My values are my values. And when they're gone, I'm sad about that. And don't, you're not going to shame me. You're not going to reduce my life into being measured and evaluated based on other people's lives. All right, last three questions. Aside from your ex... I said last three questions. Thanks for liking... Thank you, Travis. Like the video. Thank you for the contribution. Aside from your excellent course, what resources, text would you recommend on investment for, for your managers? I'm, I'm going to have to get you a list of books, and I keep forgetting my books in, in, um, in California, but I will try to get a list of books on investment portfolio managers, and I'll do, I'll do it on a show, so... Sorry, I just don't have it at the top of my mind. Uh, I'm reading D. McAuliffe's great books on the Wright brothers. That's great. I recommend it. You have an engineering degree. Can you comment on the rights? I mean, yeah. I mean, they were amazing. The, the determination, 
the hard work, the, the risk-taking, the ingenuity. I mean, they were engineers and they were bicycle repair guys, right? But that's what it was like. And, and it, was, it, was a, it was very laissez-faire. It was a beautiful era in America. And it was the era of greatest innovation ever, ever, by far. It's not close. Electricity, flight, automobile, and I'm, sh and I'm uh, indoor plumbing and toilets. Uh, and I'm missing a ton, right? Just an amazing, amazing, amazing. All right, last question. Backing currency with a fixed assets makes sense. But why have precious metals historically been chosen? Is it because of their value as a luxury item? Yes. So the, the, the precious metals have been chosen because they're pretty. People valuing, value them in and of themselves. They are rare. So there's so much gold in the world that you can only about increase the amount of gold by about 2% a year. Um, it's hard to mine, hard to find, um, easy to melt down and create new forms. So uh, they just have good characteristics, right, for money. They're, they're hard to, they're hard. So, the, 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 you know, they don't melt in your hands. They don't disappear. They're not perishable. So money has certain characteristics, and gold fits those characteristics to a T, except that it's not easy to carry around, and that's why you need currency you need paper to represent it and that's indeed how money evolved all right thanks everybody have a good rest of the week i'll see you either tomorrow or friday and um we will talk then um and remember if you want to ask a question you've got the super chat you can also send me an email yaron at yaronbrookshow.com with your questions and i will talk to you all Soon, don't forget to like the video. Don't forget to share the video. Don't forget to tell your friends. Don't forget to support the show at yaronbookshow.com slash support slash support and a Patreon and uh, subscribestar.com. Thanks, everybody. Bye.